What is happening out there, my friends, in YouTube land? You're truly rocking Dave, the real deal. North Fort Myers, South, West Florida. And just as the uh, post in uh, the post, uh, uh, it's all in the post, <laughs> in details here. It's, uh, I'm going to do a little short video here, live stream. Who knows, maybe I'll be on longer. But it's, it's talking about using a capo. And... The only times I really use the capos is pieces like that or when I was at the Renaissance Fair doing Renaissance music. Um, what I would do is try to simulate what you know, maybe a lute would sound like. Um, but basically what you're doing is you're alternating the tuning without actually messing with your tuning keys. Um, you're not drop, dropping any tuning, you're bringing the tuning up in pitch. Now this particular capo is really... Uh, designed for nylon string or, or classical guitars or flamenco guitars, and that's basically mm -hmm. what this is. Because the, uh, the I guess the tension on the little pin, if you can see that, is not as strong as what would be for a steel string. This particular one almost could resemble a, a clothes pin. <laughs> the old time, old school clothes pins. So what I'm going to do is I got my breed love over here, and I have very light gauge strings on here. Um, they're really, they're 11s with like a, what would be equivalent to a low bass for the 12. And they are electric guitar strings. And I'm going to explain why I have them. And I do love acoustic strings. On my nylon strings, I use extra hard tension. Um, part of the reason, two parts of why... Um, these are these are the um, Ernie Ball. I think the pack is called Burley Strings. The uh, third string is an unwound string. Okay, usually I do like wound strings for the acoustic. Uh, so the tension on this is just like maybe a half of point less than what would be on uh, Diodario's eleven gauge, almost between a ten and eleven gauge. 
there's two reasons why I'm using these type of strings. First and foremost, the Fazer brands on this guitar seems to uh, get tarnished real quick, with, like, like within a few days. I mean, it's, it's incredible. You know, just a few days of use and they get all... I don't know what the deal is with it. But the other reason is because this guitar has the rolling pickup. These strings seem to pick up and not wobble with the sensors on on the uh, Roland here. Whereas the Fazer Bronze, sometimes you'll get a little bit of this wobbling. Now it could be could be because of after playing and then down here in the, the, in the heat, the sweat gets down here and sweat on the strings. So it almost like codes it to the codes the string to where it's not being picked up the metal part. And that's what you know, these are, it's like a little pickup. And you could say, well, my pickup and my sound hole, I don't have any problems with that. Well, yeah, but the problem with this is, this is actually like a mini converter. Without the mini cord, it is a 13 pin, and it sends a transmission, the transmitter here, into the actual board I have, the GR55. So it has to be not super clean, you know, I mean, yeah, that helps. For it be clean, but super clean, you can have just as much problems as if, if it's dirty. So it's like in, that in between. But what is cool with this is that this capo, because I, I like I said, I don't use a capo, so I'm not gonna go out and buy a capo for a steel string. If my if I only use the capo for classical guitar, it doesn't make any sense for me. But for the purpose of this video, uh, I'm gonna put it on here because if you notice on the nylon string, there's no dots, position markers. Here, at least there is. And I'm going to put it on the fifth fret. And the reason why I'm going to put it on the fifth fret, this is a uh, my good friend and student from Aurora, Illinois. Now he, uh, he lives in Oklahoma. Hal had asked about this. And Hal's been taking lessons, classical guitar lessons, uh, with me. Since, I want to say 2011, maybe sooner, maybe earlier. And that goes back to the days at Apollo Music in Aurora, Illinois. And uh, so if you're watching this, Al, this is really going to help make sense. You're a great guy, and I appreciate your friendship. And you've been my student all these years. It helps, it does help. But he had, he sent me um, a text with a, a photo of a song, a piece of music he's going over. And the piece at the beginning of the song in details putting the capo on the fifth fret. So I'm looking at the sheet music because he only you know he sent me a picture of the first page and I was able to zoom in and yeah, capo's on the fifth fret, but that's all that was said. And then the, you got a combination of the chords and then the melody, you know, both in notation and tablature. Now, it's a key to remember what I said about notation. Because the chord uh, progression is in its, you know, little box chords with the fingering. And I believe it, it's, I know definitely it starts off with an A minor. I got to look further on that piece of music. And then for the purpose of this video, I'm only going to go into a certain detail. With the private lesson with Hal, I'm going to go into deep detail. Because it's not fair for me to spill all the beans for free. And I got people that's paying, paying me for lessons. That's not, that's not fair to them. But if this could help anyone out there who, who gets confused with a capo. Again, all you're doing is you're, you're altering the, the tuning pitch without changing the tuners. And you're not dropping any tuning. You'd have to change, you know, alter your tuners for drop tunings. And then when you use the capo, it's, you're just shifting the notes around. But in standard tuning, all you're doing is going... Well, you, you're only going up in pitch either if you drop to. So, but for this for this example, it's in standard... The guitar's in standard tuning. The piece of music is in standard tuning. So the first chord is this. And it says A minor. And then I believe it said... I believe it'll say... Um, so... Go from, slide from C, actually you think C to F. 
and it'll say go from the first fret and slide to the sixth fret. Well, there's a problem right there, and it, it's even in notation. C pitch to F. Now, I'm, I'm using this as an example. I could be wrong. It might go to E, but I'm pretty sure it goes from C to F. Well, there's a problem with this because at the very beginning, in the old days, at the very beginning of the staff, when, when you'd use a capo, it would give you the simplicity of the chords. Let's say if you're doing... Let's say we're doing A minor to E major. I'm going to do this as a... Or, or let's say A minor to F. There's a little problem here. Back in the day, you would have the simplicity of chords, A minor to F. But in parentheses, you would actually have the notes, the new notes, because you altered the pitch. And this was, back back then, and I'm talking about 30 years, 40 years ago, this was a standard procedure in sheet music, especially for people using a capo. It would get in the detail, it would have at the beginning of the staff, it would say, like for this example, uh, put the capo on the fifth fret, and then it will say you're altering your tuning up by... Um, Two whole a uh, whole step and a half step, okay. For for example, so it's kind of giving you the clue that we're altering our pitch, and in conjunction with that statement, just before the music staff, uh, right above the uh, the, the uh, treble clef symbol, they'll have that statement, and then they'll have the chords, and in the in this case it might have the chords, you know, in the little chord diagram that shows you your fingering, and it'll say A minor. But in parentheses, it's going to actually say D minor. Because the reality of this chord is now a D minor. It's an A minor shape. Yeah. You're right, it's an A minor shape. But it is actually D minor. Um, and then to prove this, I don't have my, my, uh, my, um, not my, my uh, mother tuner there. Uh, it just my my schnark tuner it finally died out, so I don't have that with me. But go ahead and put your snark tuner on it. As a matter of fact, I can prove that this right here is A minor, not E minor. Okay, here's A minor, or actually D minor. So let me—I don't want to confuse anybody. If I take this off. Now what happens is I gotta use my index finger as a bar chord. If I put the capo on the fifth fret, and if let's say I'm gonna play an E minor chord, according to what they are telling us now without the proper information. Yeah, you put your finger there, and now it's E minor. That's not E minor in the actual pitch, it's A minor. A minor. A minor. Okay. So now the the melody starts and it'll say you're gonna play and actually even with the capo it'll say fifth fret and then slide up to the uh, the uh, sixth fret. And then above in notation it says um, C and then slide up to F. We'll see What's going on here is that this note right here, that's not C, that's F. And if I slide up to equivalent of what they call the the first the sixth fret, that's A sharp. See, this is not the first fret. I understand what they're doing. When you put this on, you're omitting this. And now this becomes, this takes the place of your nut. But you're still altering your pitch. And you, you'll, you'll find out real quick if you're taking a piece of music that, let's say you got the capo and it's on the fifth fret, then you got the keyboard player that's accompanying you, and you're telling the keyboard player, yep, I'm playing A minor. 
to F, and then my my melody starts here. So you play the melody with me, Mr. Keyboard Player or Miss Keyboard Player, and we're gonna play C, and we're gonna go to F, and then she plays along with you, and she looks at you and says, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, that's not the notes," and you're like, "Well, that's what the book says, or that's what the piece of music says." No, no, that's not what it is. And I know people who have been playing for a while, you know this. But what about the people who are just new to this? They don't. And this is what starts to set the uh, uh, a massive amount of confusion for people. Like I said, if you were to go back in time or find older pieces of music, sheet music, and even if that would include, you know, tablature, but look at the notation. It's going to be very clear what it is, especially if you go back into the 80s or in the 70s when, it, when we weren't using tablature. Your pitch is going to be, it's going to be very specific. It's going to let you know. It might even have alternating. So if, let's say, for here's the music for specifically for the guitarist, okay? And you might find something that says, oh, a cape on the fifth fret, and it'll say, okay, but these are your actual notes. It's going to say D minor, which is, that's what this is. And then here is A sharp. If you're, if, this is not F, even though that's supposed to represent the nut. You can't, watch, you can't play, you can't play anything. But I'm going to be on my B string, the same pitch. Nothing's going to happen. Now, unless you alter this, move this, that opens up the other strings. That's a different story, but. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the capo across all six strings on the fifth fret. So, and then again, this note is F, and it slides to A sharp. The amount of confusion that happens is, is it's pretty incredible because there's no proper explanation going on. And I'm not trying to knock it, you know, we live in a very fast uh, time where sheet music is being pumped. It, there's, people cannot keep up with the demands of what's going on. And that's what's happening. But you see, this is what happens when you are going to rush through learning something. And then if someone tells you, you can master the guitar before you take it out of the case. This is, this is not reality. This, is, this really is not reality. Everyone will learn at their own pace. And everyone's ability to um, retain information is different. And everybody's hands are different. And you have to also take in consideration, not only do we learn at, you know, our own pace, we're our own individual, you know, person, but there are kids I've dealt with that when they were younger played sports and then had an injury, or there's adults I, I dealt with, and it's, of course, always later on when they're adults, they start feeling, you know, um, the consequence of that injury. And they're like, ooh, maybe I didn't properly let it heal. Or maybe I did let it heal, but I didn't know I was going to later on in life learn guitar. And the reality is, if you don't play an instrument, you do not put your fingers in these weird, like if you're playing piano or keyboards, you know, you have these different movements. Your hands will be like this, or, you know, if you're standing up, different movements. Now, you might be like that if you're, you know, typing. Or that. So that's, I want to say it's similar. It's, it's similar. It's not the same. But for guitar, you're not going to walk around with your hand like this, doing the shape of a D chord, a C chord, an A minor chord, a bar. You're just not going to do it if you don't play. You may, you know, rock out when you're pretending, yeah, you know, rock and roll and all that, air guitar. But when you're actually going to learn to play, you know, it, now you have to form your fingers. This is when you find out about these uh, injuries that you've had in the past, and now they resurface. So now, and I've had this, I've had this with students where I had to alter my lessons for them specifically because of these situations. Now that's just with injury. Now let's get into the fact that everyone ages, you know, you're going to get older. And, you know, if you're blessed to live long enough to start getting into your golden years, you might start to experience, you know, arthritis or, you know, things of that nature. You might not be able to do something now that you were able to do maybe five, was as, as recent as five, maybe two or three years ago. It's, it's going to have an effect on your approach of playing. So you have all these variables going on. So when you throw in the fact that 
it could get confusing with the capo. See, I'll tell you one thing with the capo. For people who have the inability to hold a bar chord long enough, and let's say when they were younger, they could fall asleep with the guitar on like this, and boy, they got that bar chord like a vice grip. No problems. But now they're getting older, now there's problems. So, and they still want to be in the game, whether they're out playing or they're playing for their own pleasure. They still want to be able to play. So, the alternative is to make things a little bit simpler for, simpler for them so they don't fight with the instrument and get frustrated. No one wants to get frustrated, right? So, you know, that's part of the reason with the capo. You know, people would say they play these chords. Okay? And it makes life a little easier. They're still able to make music and still be able to have that enjoyment without the stress. Okay? So, that's one nice thing with using a capo. But again, you have to keep in mind when you start getting, you know, when you're downloading sheet music or, you know, if you're watching videos and, you know, there's a lot of good people out there you know maybe they don't think about these things I really don't know but you have to keep in mind that you are altering your pitch and you don't have to worry about it so much it's not gonna stop your ability to play because see watch this I put the capo on if I go like that if I go like this and I'll say if I don't know what the chord is but I still know how to play the chord I'm still making music So you see what I mean? So I'm still able to make music. So it's when you want to start getting to theory, then you put this on and you just say, well, you just can move up a few steps. Now it's like very easy to get confused. And some people, like I said, some people, everyone learns at their own pace. You know, you're going to learn at your own pace. I learn at my pace. That's life. That's how it is with everything. Don't let that frustrate you. But just keep in mind that you did alter your pitch. This is when you get in, into the topic of communicating with other musicians. Or you want to play a duet with somebody. Especially if it's with a keyboard player. You know, one thing with keyboards, you got the accent. And I'm going to talk, piano player, yeah, exactly. But let's say you got a keyboard player. You have the pad with string, soft strings going on. Piano and soft strings to accompany your playing. Now you got to communicate with each other and do the best that you can the first thing that's going to happen when you call this A minor the keyboard player is a fine A minor and it's going to it's going to clash it's going to be and it's like something's not there's something's clashing here because what's happening you didn't alter the tune you can't put a capo on I mean I could put a capo on a keyboard all once I could do anything you know so this is what's happening you're altering your pitch so let's try, I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to take the capo off, and what we're going to do is we're going to go over, cross all six strings, first position, uh, a C minor scale, but we're going to start with open E. So we're going to go across all six strings, all natural notes, no sharps or flats, equivalent to C major or A minor. Okay. But again, all six strings. So here's, here's the deal. Open E, F, G. Open A, B, C. Open D, E, F. Open G, A. Open C, I mean open B, C, D. And then open E, F, G. So now what happens here is if I want to mimic that exact same pattern, just remember, when I start with a string, I just playing open. I mean, I'm not fretting that first note.
So you might see, well, yeah, we're going to play a C major scale across all six strings, starting with the open E, the low E. And here's the pattern. And then the person says, we got E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That is not it when you put the cape on the fifth fret. Those are not the notes. Here's the notes. A, A sharp, C, D, E, F. I mean, yeah, D, E, F right there. We have here G, A, A sharp, C, D, E, F, G, A, A sharp, C. I gotta open up the door for, for somebody here. <laughs> there you go, folks. Okay, so. And I'm hoping that this is not confusing people, but you'll get confused if you're going to play with somebody and who says, okay, we don't, I'm not going to use a capo. You could use a capo. And as soon as they see what you're doing, they're going to alter it or they just, just might use their, you know, bar chord. And then we'll be able to play, play around that. But especially if you're going to play with a keyboard player, because then you're going to spend a lot of time um, having a discussion about what pitch you're playing, what key you're playing in, and, and all of that. So, um, that's basically, basically that in a nutshell. I, I, it, no matter where you put the cable, you're altering the tuning. Okay? So now, if I have it on the uh, second fret, and I go to play that same scale, now it's F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, and A. And now this chord right here is B minor. This chord here is F sharp minor. These are just your chord forms. That's what's going on. Well, let's say it's A minor, or it's E minor, A minor, uh, and let's say D shape. It's a D shape, yeah? But it's not D, it's E. I'll play that same chord without the capo. And see, sometimes if you want to play the low, you know, the root note there, the lower root note. And if you cannot do that, well, then you just omit that note. But let's say you want to, and you can't play because you have a certain inability, you have an injury or something, maybe a little arthritis is kicking in or whatever, and you still want to play. Well, put the capo there. So those are the benefits of that. It's just, again, like I said, you're, just, you're, you're changing your pitch, altering your pitch. That's the only thing that's going on with that. So um, when you look at when you look at the uh, sheet music, and it says put the capo on the fifth fret. If it's telling you the first fret, you're gonna play that note and slide up to the sixth fret. You can say this is your first fret. You can say I mean this is your open fret right here. This is omitted, and you can say that's your first fret. And that's your sixth fret. But if you're going to go for actual pitch, that is not your first fret. That is your sixth fret. That note is not C. It's F. This note right here is not F. This note is A sharp. A sharp or B flat. It's the same thing, but it's A sharp. This chord right here is no longer A minor, even though it looks like an A minor shape. It's D minor. This is not A major, I mean uh, F major, it's A sharp major.
So just keep that in mind and don't get confused. Don't get frustrated. The best thing is not to get frustrated. It's just if you ever needed to understand what your pitch is, that's when the, that's the advantage. That's when you got to analyze things. And that's when the advantage is of knowing your fretboard. If you know your fretboard, and for some people it takes a while. I get it. Don't rush things. That's why when I teach this, I always teach in one string from open position to the 12th fret. Sometimes they go a little further. You know, all that's happening is these notes are repeating like they're up here. What's here on the 1st fret, F, is down here on the 13th fret, F. It's just a full octave higher, pitch higher. That's what it is. Open E, 12th fret E. So once you know that fretboard, it's... You never get confused. So, anyways, my friends, I hope this really helps. And, hell, if you see this, I hope this helps you. I will get into a lot more detail with lessons. I'll, that I promise you. And I'm going to come up with I, ways of going over the bar chords that you could, if you're in a situation, and kind of this, I, I will say this to anyone out there. If you're having a situation where, man, you've been trying this for years and you know, a reoccurring injury has, you know, the pain from an injury has been reoccurring and, and really hindering your ability to do something, be very creative on getting around that. So let's say if you cannot play an F major chord or an F minor chord, well then play half of that chord. Yeah, you, you're going to lose the low end. Okay, I, I, you, you're not going to be able to make that up because of your ability. But if it's just, just too much and it's straining right here, right, let's see if I get this so you can see it. Right here, you start feeling that strain, then don't kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. You know? The only time you got to be very critical on it is if you're going to start getting into uh, guitar competitions. And I'm going to be quite frank. You, when you start getting into classical guitar competitions, or anything jazz oriented where you have to, there's no comping. You know, comping is a term, it's it's a abbreviation of a term called accompaniment. When you're playing with a, an ensemble, you have the luxury of dropping off certain notes because maybe the bass player is going to play that low. Or if you got a piano player, they're going to play more in that lower register. Or if you got, you know, a, a, tri a guitar trio or even a duo, you could, you could, assign certain parts of the fretboard to one guitarist and then you take on the other part. You know, that's usually that's usually what happens because especially if you got, you know, a, a quartet or a quintet, you got all this sound coming at you after all playing a full chord, it's, and you don't want that wall of sound, this is where it's going to sound pretty, okay, there's too much going on here. So how can I alter this? You start, a comp, you start comping, you know, you might play this part of the F major, or you just might play this. You might have someone play that part, and someone play the lower end. And when you blend it together, it's not gonna sound like mush. So that's that's one way of, of, of thinking about that. But if you're solo, just understand that, yeah, you lose some of that, um, but you'll still be able to play the chord. And what you'll have to do is pick the most audible sound of that chord. Meaning, if I'm going to play an F major, but for, for just a brief nanosecond, you hear that low F, and you hear, let's say, the, the uh, F and the C for a very short, like I said, not even a fraction of the second, but mostly you're hearing from the octave F and, and right into the high register. If that becomes more uh, monumental to, you know, to focus on, it becomes of a primary sound, we'll just play that. It's not justifying to be lazy or cheating. You're coming up with a very creative way so that you could still stay in the game and play and still enjoy yourself without, you know, beating yourself up against a brick wall saying, Man, but I got to play this. I got to do this again. No, you don't. Unless you put yourself in that position. Okay. But if not, be creative. Because the real reality is, is, whatever inabilities or pains that you feel in your hand, you're going to be the one feeling it, not someone that is judging you. 
They're not going to be feeling it, but you will. And again, if you wanted to continue your journey in playing music, the best thing to do is find ways to eliminate as much frustration and stress as possible. We all know, you know, as, as possible, we all know that when we're learning, yeah, we got to build our strength. And we all know these things. But there is a reality, and I have dealt with students, and, and I've dealt not just with students, people I've played with. You know, thank God, I have not had any in, in, incidences where I have an inability. Little by little, I start to feel sometimes in this area, you know, just a little bit. But after almost 50 years of playing, I, I thank God I'm able to do what I'm able to do. And I've had friends tell me, uh, you know, Dave, if you were ever to stop playing for especially a, a longer period of time, you might even start to develop arthritis or you might have these issues. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. But I don't want to take that chance because I love playing. This is my passion. So for me, I stay in the game. But I have in my mind ways I could alter things where I could still play those main melodies in a piece of music. Because the reality is, I am getting older. I'm not in my 20s anymore. I'm now approaching my 60s. That is the reality. So I, I, I get myself mentally. Here's, here's something that might help everybody out there. As you age, get yourself mentally prepared for these things so that they don't spring up as a, as a surprise. You, you, you're going you, you're gonna to start feeling a little bit of the pain when you start saying to yourself, man, I can't do this. Like, what's going on? I used to be able to do this. And it might be something as simple as being able to tie your shoes or doing something a little quicker without having a dizzy spell or anything like that. If you prepare yourself that these are possibilities, as you get older, Randy Tripp, what's happening? Legend Blaze, what's happening, guys? Sorry, now I'm starting to see you know, who's in the live chat. You know, here's something that's interesting. Randy, you had a, uh, you had an injury. Now, I'll, I'm not going to you know, talk too much about it because I'm sure everyone knows. But you, you had a, a pretty major injury not too long ago. So you know you're, what you probably had to go through, a, a rehabilitation. You know what I mean? You had to go through these things, and you probably are not 100% like you were before the injury. So you see, these things happen. You could get into a car accident. Something could happen. It could alter something. So now, I think one of the hardest things that we're going to go through is, man, I used to be able to do this, and the frustration, it's that instant moment. The frustration kicks in, and it's like, you start really, really feeling it, and it's like, it bothers you. Now, we all know how frustrating guitar playing could be when you're trying to play something that's outside of your league at that moment. Yes, yeah, still going through rehab. Yes, yeah, see, Randy? And I hope, I hope everything is going well with you, brother. I really do. And you know there's a process. I used to drive, and I've said this before on this channel. I used to do uh, NEMT, non-emergency medical transportation. And the stories I would hear from people um, would make me, all, make me think, especially when I would hear them say, you don't know how lucky you are to get up to go to work. Now, who, it's always a dream of, Man, I can't wait till I retire, or I want to be a full-time musician. Or just, there are positives and negatives. There's pros and cons to everything. But it's very interesting hearing that statement, and it never I've, I've never forgotten it, because it rang such a very loud, loud, loud bell in my head and was a very, very deep statement. You don't know how lucky you are to get up to go to work. You're the driver as opposed to the rider. And, of course, I'd be taking these people to all kind of, you know, rehab and dialysis and all kind of stuff. So you start analyzing everything. Yes, I... Let's see. Uh, yes. Truckloads of firewood yesterday and in my back about 90... Yeah, see? Yeah, you saw it. Two truckloads of firewood yesterday, so I'm back about 95%. That's good. That's great. Yeah, yeah, Randy, that, that's great. You know, of course, 
how we bounce back. A lot of it, a lot of it is 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 mental. But even with that being said, you're gonna have to understand that you have an injury. You're gonna push yourself because you want to build up your strength. But then there are times you could push it too much, and that little bit of a pain is reminding you, not yet. We're getting there. We're getting there, but but not not yet. So, just just think about that. If you hurt your hand or even part of your shoulder or any part of your body, it's going to affect. It will affect. See, this is why. Um, when I would get, be, and I, I still found a lot of my old soundboard magazines, and in the later years that I've that I still had them. I would read these articles from these physicians. And they would start to look at the reality of, because, you know, if you're going to study classical guitar, especially in the old, day, old days, it was very, very rigid and strict. You had to sit up proper posture and this, you had to do all kinds of things. And uh, later on, they started to realize, well, wait a minute, we're starting to see another generation come up where classical music is not as popular, popular as it once was. And then a new generation coming in. Well, you know, the average person that's going to take classical guitar lessons and they want to play at the restaurant. And then the restaurant says, yeah, we'll hire you. We will act the class. And they come up to you and they ask you to play Beatles and Led Zeppelin and maybe Queen or The Doors. And you tell them, no, I play classical guitar. But see, they don't understand. See, that's how far generations have gotten. Well, my point is, is that they started to realize we're in a new generation where we cannot force this amount of strictness on, on, these, on these new students because we don't know, maybe they play football, maybe they're in sports and they have an injury and we're being very strict and they're taking our word verbatim, but now later on they got issues. You see? Of course, now we live in a generation where everyone, you know, they, they go to the ambulance chasers, you know, lawyers and they're going to sue everybody so that I think that might have had something to do with it too but the point being made is that you have to start to think creatively you know now what strings you use on acoustic uh, brother I've been waiting oh wanting to ask you oh okay for this particular guitar I got and I'm trying this as an experiment um, they're the Ernie Ball Bur Burley strings I think they're called I don't know if I have a, an, an empty pack I could show you. But they're basically, I think they're on 11 to 11 gauge, but they're basically electric guitar strings. The uh, G is not wound, which I, I do kind of like having a wound G because, you know, on, a, on, on acoustic they could go out. Um, now, there's, a, there's two reasons why I'm using this. The main one, well, they're both, both important. These strings, let me see if I can get that. They do, and they've been on for a while. They do not tarnish like Fazer Brown's tarnish. And, you know, from the sweat, then they start tarnishing here. They start tarnishing here. They get old real fast, real, real fast. And I don't know if you've experienced this. Certain guitars with certain fretboards, woods, would make strings get older quicker. I don't know why. Plus, if you're going to play outside in the summertime, no matter where you're living, summer, especially in the high heat, heat and humidity is heat and humidity. We just have it longer down here in Florida. Um, it makes the strings go dull quicker. Now, when you add to the fact that I've got this Roland pickup on here, I've had this on here since, what, 2016 or something like that. These are little... They're like little pickups, these little, you can see them, sensors. But what this does is, they're not your standard pickup type. Well, it doesn't really matter. This will matter when you when it runs into the guitar synth, because when you start picking certain sounds, let's say you want piano and strings, and if you get to arpeggiate and do something like this, you got to be careful not to do this, unless you set the sensor in the guitar synth, where it'll be able to sense that wobbly, because if not, you'll get these jumps, these weird jumps. It's like it's trying to keep up with you, and it can't. So these 
strings, the, the, this little pickup picks up these strings better than the Fazer Browns. I don't get these. But they call them, they're known as hiccups. And if anyone has used any type of a MIDI device or a guitar synthesizer, you'll know what I mean. I know technology gotten a lot better now, so it's probably irrelevant. But the first part of this statement with these strings, they don't tarnish. That's not irrelevant. I don't I don't need this guitar synth. They, they'll still get tarnished. So, um, but they are still since they're electric guitar strings in the 11 to 11 gauge. You can even get them like in 12 gauge. They're going to be a slight point lighter than the actual acoustic string. So if that makes any difference. Um, they will make it easier for like bar chords. There's still going to be, you know, you're still going to get the same tightness. And that's kind of important to understand. You start switching from light gauge to heavy gauge, you know, that amount of tension, if you're keeping standard tuning, could over time start to a little bit, you'll notice that you'll, you'll have tuning issues. Um, now, I will say this. If you're looking for a really nice, rich, full acoustic sound, then go with an acoustic guitar string because there is that difference with these. Okay, but if you're playing like rock or metal or any type of a fusion based where it really won't matter, then you'll be you'll do all right with these. The only ones who are real who will knock you will be other guitar players, other musicians. I don't even I don't even listen to that negative talk. You're the one playing your guitar. That's what you now again. You can experiment, but to to answer your question directly, they are electric guitar strings. And, you know, you could try it. Try, if you're going to do this, let's say, let's say you're using 13s on, on your acoustic. Well, find, and you want to experiment with this. Try to find as close to that 13 gauge acoustic. And if you match it, let's say, with 13 gauge electric. The only thing you might experience is a very slight less tension on on the tension so it might be instead of it being let's say an actual 13 gauge it might come out to be like a 12.75 gauge or something but the tensions could be real similar real similar but it's been my experience that using these i, I don't get the strings to tarnish and they do seem to last longer This this has been a great guitar. We got this in two thousand nine. It is a Breedlove Passport, and I know Breedlove had changed their logo where they actually spelled the word out across here, um, but that was their old logo. And I think if you buy their, you know, USA made, especially in the custom shop, it's still going to have this logo on there. And uh, yeah, we got this. Like I said two thousand and nine late 2009 and that's been a great workhorse no problems original nut original bridge original tuners it has the uh the tuner that's on here that the light went out I, you know this is what you get it's not very it works but the readout screen is not clear um it has one volume a high and low so if you're going to run this to any type of a pa or something and you want to get more of a full range control over the mids you would have to get eq an equalizer that will also cover your mid-range i got the windows open so the neighbors are starting their cars <laughs> now that that yamaha guitar i think i think Rand, you've got a yamaha pacifica i mean not pacifica apx i have similar in there uh, nylon string, uh, the NTX 700. But before I had this, I had uh, APX 500. You know, natural wood finish. Great guitar. 
it was a great, great guitar. Um, it had a very full range EQ system. I think better than here. The EQ se section was better than what's on the Taylors. I was shocked when you plug it in. The thing is, is that when I put the guitar synth pickup on my old one, and the, the centers are still spaced the same, it was not matching under the, under the saddle. So what I did is I took a piece of paper and I drew from this point to that point and on that piece of paper I drew exactly where my censors were and I marked it on this piece of paper low E on this one high E. Took that piece of paper went to Guitar Center matched where it would fit almost perfectly and definitely fit on this guitar. And I happened to like it because I, I did read about some of the Breedlove guitars being good so and uh, it worked out great. And what I do like about this, it's a pinless bridge. So if you do need to change the string, it's quick. Everything's quick. And again, the capo is really meant for the nylon string. So I can use it with this because the strings are a little bit lighter. Looks mostly set for the nylon string. Now the nylon strings, I use Diodario. I go back and forth between hard tension and extra hard tension. Um, because of my, my picking technique, I don't like the strings to wobble so much. But if you've ever owned an island string, when you change these strings, it's a process, man. It is definitely a process. But once you get locked in, man, they just stay locked in. And this, this guitar, man, is really great. It's got the uh, Fishman uh, full uh, system on here. And this guitar is 20, just November. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be 22 years I've had this guitar. This guitar made me a lot of money. Made Deb and I a lot of money. It's gone to Europe with us. It's gone to Canada, to Mexico, to all over, all over our, our travels. That guitar has been there, and uh, never had any issues, never. And when we bought it, it was uh, what was it on sale for eight ninety nine, and the model number is the C. W E S uh, and it says 2001 and it does not say made in China it does say I pronounce it Cordoba, uh, Cordoba but I believe it's pronounced Cordoba Espanol so this could have been made over in Europe I don't know I really don't know there's nowhere and I'm not going to take the thing apart to say where is it made where is it made you know but Back then, you had the Gypsy Kings model, and this was the model underneath it. And the Gypsy Kings was like 1600 bucks. It was nice. But then when I played this, this felt just as nice, if not nicer. And I was able to save money, so Deb said, yeah, let's grab this one. And it's been, uh, man, it's been with us everywhere. It's been with us everywhere. So, but my friends, I hope this has been helpful with using the capo and, and the strings. And, and just, uh... Yeah, mine is the FG. Oh, all mahogany. That's right. But I thought I thought you did have at one time uh, the Yamaha APX. I could be mistaken. The APX series, I believe, it had a full twenty-two frets. I know the nylon string one in there. It's got twenty-two frets, which is kind of un uncommon for a steel string and even a nylon string because here we got. I think this is twenty frets. So we got 15, 17, 19, 20. Yeah, so I got G, um, A, B. I just go up to C right here. Now I do know LTD has a thin line acoustic where the fret board comes on an angle, I believe. And I think you get 24 frets off of the high, high E and the B string. Which, and it's got a nice cutaway, which is, which is cool. I don't know about the Godan guitars. Those are nice because for their um, synthesizer pickup, because you can't really use this pickup on an island string. It's not going to pick up because they're not steel. But how Godan uses their system is that the saddle actually has these, these this type built to the saddle. So it's like it sits on these sensors. So when you play, it'll, it'll pick up. 
I've got a 1976 Yamaha FJ. Yeah, I keep that. Yeah, Randy, if you could keep that, I'm going to tell you right now, Yamaha guitars have always been great guitars, man. They have always been great guitars. I wish I would have kept the... Well, I, 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 I wish I would have kept, but I gave it to a friend who really deserved it. So, I have no regrets giving it away. But I used to have a um, Yamaha SBG3000. Not SG, SBG3000. That's what they were called back then. It was white with the pearl uh, abalone in, uh, body binding and the flower and the inlay and all that and the uh, fretboard, you know, pearl and abalone and it had the push pots with the black uh, pick guard. Bought it at Guitar Center uh, December 1985. $5.99 with the hard shell case. And that was the next through. And uh, I guess it was... It was basically, uh, and it was a thick, you know, the SBGs were like Les Pauls, except almost shaped like SG, but they were real, real thick. And uh, gold hardware. And uh, it was kind of like a dedication to um, Rick Emmett from Triumph, because when he released his live, double live album, he was using Yamaha guitars, so. But, uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Hey, Bumble Best, what's happening? I appreciate you tuning in, man. Sir, problem number nine, what is happening? I hope all is well with you, my friend. Um, I'll send you a text message a little bit later. I've been a little bit busy. We're Thursday. We got the roofers coming. So, and then over last week, we did a, it was an NGD New Gear Day. We couldn't really do the unboxing. Because what did we get for our music? Drum machine roll, please. A new transmission for our car. So, at, at, at these interest rates, we're not going to buy a new car. We just put a new transmission in my car. So, yeah, you know, you do the things you need to do. But, uh, yeah, so that's what's going on here. Oh, yeah. I've uh, seen those. They are, yeah, they're awesome guitars. They're awesome guitars right here. Yeah, they did. They Yeah, you know what? Here's here's the thing, Surf Nine, uh, Surf Prophet Nine. Here's the thing. You could get a lot of people will say if you go to the dealership, you get ripped off. You know, this is different times we live in. I'm not a mechanic, especially now with the way these cars are. Deb used to work at Auto Nation Toyota, and before that, and we were always doing our music. So, but we have done other things in conjunction with our music. But when we were in the construction business and we had a couple of companies, stair, Custom Oak Stair Company, that Deb had that and with her business partner. And then I went to trade school and we had a HVAC. And we go to a business and we do residential new construction. We go to all the, um, the trade show meetings specifically for our trade. And everyone would say, you know, Keep in mind, and especially for the owner-operators, keep in mind that if you don't, are not certified on something, and you don't have the license, you might know how to fix everything. Maybe better than the person with certification and the license. But what happens sometimes, stuff right from the manufacturer can have a defect. And if you have a part that's defected and you let someone touch something because they know how to do it, except it's a defected part. And you still have issues. You let someone uncertified touch something and now there goes the warranty. And then the customer is all PO'd and because they don't care what, they, what you say you know or you don't know. They just know that now it's going to cost them money out of their pocket. So, and in conjunction with that, we'd have instructors tell us if you're out in the field and, you know, the missus or the husband who's 80 or doesn't want to touch anything, ask you to move something or check the water heater. Or could you, could you move the dryer out a little bit? You know, I'll unplug it and get, don't touch anything. You're there for only one piece of equipment. Don't touch anything else because then when you go to put it back and they plug it in, it's not working. Now, oh, how do we know that the HVAC guy didn't do something when he moved it? 
oh, now you're buying them a new dryer, or if you do anything with the water, you're buying them. So it could be a very costly mistake. And I've had friends of mine, you know, they mean well, but they're just trying to, you know, guys who bust our balls and all that stuff, you know. But they're telling me, ah, oh, don't worry about it, Dave. Ah, oh, yeah, see, so you're wimping out. Yeah, no, no, no. There are certain things I don't know about, and that's just that's the way it is. But even if I knew about it, what I do know, since we were contractors, is we don't touch anything without the license, without being certified in that, because that's how they're going to get you. And then... If you go tinkering or you take it to the mechanic down the street who, you know, knows everything about everything and his garage is at the back of the liquor store that he's a part-time employee at the liquor store, but he's back there with the garage, you see, and he's got all the parts, but he, he's got all the tools, but he cannot get the proper parts. Because here's another thing how they get you. So the real experience is if you're working on a carrier furnace, the brackets are a little bit different than if you're working on a Lennox. See, so some parts, at least it was back then, some parts are not universal. So then you try to retrofit something, and over the course of time, something goes wrong, and then you find out, well, you're not qualified. You needed to get those qualified parts. See, they, they, they find all kind of ways to get around it. So Deb and I say, you know what? It might appear to cost us a lot of money at that point, but it's going to double if I send it to a guy that's an expert and knows everything about everything, but yet he can't get the parts right, he's got to retrofit something, or he doesn't have to get the or worry about all that, but the part is defected and he ordered it and he put it in when he is not a certified mechanic on that car or what, whatever it might be. And this is how they get you. Now, something went wrong. Now you're paying double. So, I don't know. I'd rather get laughed at and pay once than to be praised. Yeah, that's how you do it, Dave. And guess what? It doesn't work and I'm paying double. Because all the people that just praise me, they're not going to help me pay that double price. i got to pay it. So, I'd rather go for the first part. You know what I mean? And I'm not, I'm not trying to knock anybody that knows how to do this. And there's a lot of people out there know way more than I know about this. But I let them do it. That's why they have that job. Just like me saying, hey, the mechanic, he's got the, he's got, you know, cuts all over his fingers. Maybe he's only got, you know, missing uh, part of his pinky and it's all dirty. And he says, come on, I got a gig time. Why don't you play bass for me? He's never played in his whole life or maybe with one finger. He's not qualified. Just like I'm not qualified. So why do I want to put myself in those situations? You know, I joke and just around with all that, but you, you get you get the point. So it's it's just it is something to think about. Um like for instance down here with the hurricane. We're still not recovery, we had the roofers come out, they told us, they gave us a price, and we've had people say, Oh, that's that's all expensive. Well, see now it's even more expensive because when we signed the contract that was back in October when he was able to come out. And it's look, it's it's February. And the guys have come out Thursday. So that's how long. Everyone's been on a long waiting list. But he told us he specializes in these type of homes. He's been working in our community for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, something like that. And he's licensed, he's bought it, and he's got the insurance. But, and he's got the, you know, the... Uh, the, the certifications to get these parts to work on these things. He said, because it'd be very interesting you get these people that could buy the parts, not certified, and then and they don't have the license or the insurance. And down here in Florida, it's interesting. You can have people come from different states to help us with the recovery, you know, at that moment of the hurricane. But now the rebuild, if you don't have a license in the state of Florida, don't do it. Don't do it because I've heard stories of people saying they'll make you tear all that work down and rebuild it because you got to get the permits. They'll start finding you, and it is a big mess, man. And I'm like, you know what? Don't even want to touch it. So, I mean, we were able to do our patch job when we needed to, but that's just a patch job. So, we signed the contract with him back in October. Now he's coming out Thursday. 
And if he, and I'm not, I don't think they would, but let's say if they did a, a hack job, well, then see, that's on them because they're the ones that certified. They're the ones with the, uh, the license. They're the ones with the insurance. I cannot go after somebody that's a part-time liquor store clerk that's working out of the back of the liquor store with his ladder and his pickup truck, and he's going to start patching up roofs between drinks, you know? And I'm just joking about that. Uh, you'd be surprised what people think they could do and they can't do. And they, it's real important. I would not recommend um, major work being done, whether it's on your car or your house or HVA system. And when something goes wrong, you're going you're gonna to be eating that cost. You're going to be eating that cost. And uh, things got a whole lot more expensive, as we know. So, but, but people do what they want. And if they prove me wrong, hey, that's great, man, because I learned something new. Yeah, new transmission. Yeah. Yep. But you know what, Bumble Best? It is still a lot cheaper than buying we uh, buying a new a new car. Because the prices have just shot up. Now, yesterday we were at the dealership and Deb she we always take the cut like I said, she worked over there in, in the sales department, yeah. And she she knows what's going on. So we take the cars over there to get the oil change and that. And we were just looking around. We went out to breakfast, came back looking around, and they had a nice Toyota uh, Sierra. I think it, no, that's that's GMC. So don't I can't remember what it was. Anyways, um, SUV sport SUV, real nice. Looks like it looks like it is on the Tundra chassis because I think the Forerunners are on the Tacoma chassis, where this thing is on the Tundra. Looks chassis. Anyways, looks cool. Couldn't see the sticker price because it wasn't really there. It was like part of the sticker price, but not the actual sticker price. Well, when we uh, were able to do the paperwork and get everything done, we asked the lady that was looking at that, and she told us that thing's going for a hundred grand. Actually, a hundred fifteen thousand. But if you've been uh, uh, dealing with Toyota for it, they give you a certain percentage off. But a hundred thousand dollars, you know. It's like with some of these, these pickup trucks. You know, a lot of them, man, used. They're like in the $70,000 range. Um, and, you know, you, you look at stuff like that. It was, if you could buy an RV, you know, you want to have something that's going to pull. Or you're going to buy a boat or something. You want something that's got some good torque. Rule of thumb is, whatever your, your weight is, your dry weight is, imagine that filled with even more, because that's the reality, what people are going to be doing with an RV, even on a boat, because they might put some stuff and leave some some gear on the boat, so you just added all that extra weight, plus the weight of the trailer, so you want to, I think my brother-in-law, he's real smart with this, he said, if you could get, if you could get it where you have maybe between 700 to 1,000 pounds of extra headroom, towing extra room, you'll, you'll be doing all right, because you might get the idea, say, hey, man, I'm going to visit my friends in Colorado. And was, or, you know, through the Smoky Mountains or something. And as soon as you start going up those hills, that's when you start feeling all that pressure on that on that vehicle from all that weight. And uh, it happened with some people when they bought RVs. They didn't realize it. They, they, they talk about dry weight. They don't let you know what if you got the tanks full of water and you go across country... And you're pulling and pulling, and you're going up and down these hills. And as soon as you go up, you're putting all that stress on that engine. That's when they start finding out. So, that's just something to keep in mind. Interesting topics, from the capo to transmissions, huh? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, guys, I... Yeah, 100K, I get... Yeah, yeah, exactly, Bumble Best, 100K. 100,000, if we had an extra $100,000 to play with, I know, I because we'll do the research, we could find a, a nice size RV trailer and a nice pickup for cheaper than that. Um, I, po I, I, I don't know if I posted up. I'll, maybe I'll do a post of a... Or maybe I did do a post with that lab. It was a, a, a green, like a, like a lime green Lamborghini 
and then I did another post, the lime green Lamborghini next to our Toyota RAV. Now, I don't know what that Lamborghini, I didn't, we didn't even know where the, the, uh, the owner of that car was. We were filling up gas and, you know, I don't know, maybe he's working at the gas, I don't know what he's doing, where he was, he or she, don't know. But, we know that as cool as that Lamborghini is, is that, where am I going to put all this stuff for the, for the gigs? And that car is going to be astronomically expensive. Great car. I'm not knocking it. Astronomically expensive. All the parts on it are high performance. Astronomically expensive. And then your car payment, astronomically expensive. And then the insurance, even though that we're in our 50s and now approaching 60s, astronomically expensive. Everything is lose, 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 lose. For a two-sheeter coffin that could go from 0 to 180 in less than 3.0. 3.1 seconds, or, or yeah, a, a nanosecond, you know, and for what, I can't drive that fast down here or anywhere, <laughs> it's, it's, it's unpractical for me, great for some people, you got the money, go for it, not practical for me, so, uh, let's see, yeah, you can get a, for half, yeah, exactly, yeah, two exactly. Yep, yep. Yeah, you know what? That is right. Yeah, those that is what those are called. Because I one of the jobs I was gonna apply for down here was driving for dolphin transportation. And at the time it was I think it was owned or man either owned by another owner and managed by another managed com company, but they changed long since long since then. But we went on on a, on a driving test. Of course, I got my CDL license and that, so I'm driving. And the bus I was driving was a, a Tanzum. They said it was, they're, they're manufactured in Turkey. The starter is outside, Kilo start outside in a compartment that's kind of hidden. You gotta, he, he showed me the code to key, to key in the code to get the door open and then the, a key punch to get the thing started. But the cockpit was just unreal, man. It was just beautiful. All lit up, all digital, backup cameras, side cameras, um, these shades that come down. I mean, it looked like looked like the uh, the bridge of the Enterprise. I mean, it was just totally badass. And you said, yeah, this one of the cheaper ones going for three hundred and sixty four grand or something like that. And I was driving up and down I seventy five. It drove nice, man. You couldn't even hear it. It was just unreal, man. But, yeah, but then they wanted me to, one, one, one of the, the places they'll have me do is pick up in Miami. See, we live in North Fort Myers, which is just the town north of Fort Myers. They're right next to each other. The shop was in Naples. It was 40 miles one way from my house. And then I'd have to, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, the gigs, my assignments was to drive the bus over to Miami and picked them up and then he says you got your passport right oh yeah because then this particular assignment would take clients from Miami up to Ontario Canada so lots of driving and you know I would be picking up for Boston Red Sox and whatever celebrity whatever celebrity they threw at me or, or at the company whoever wanted on um, but the problem was, I don't think they were getting those accounts like they once were. Because I'd be driving back and forth, going down to the base, and I see all these other companies, NT and T, American Charters, uh, Cross Country Charter, all these different charter companies. Except I noticed Dolphin was not as much as it was prior to me. Uh, applying for that 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 job, and one the, one of the things was is that they pay you by percentage of what they were making. So they said we would get eighteen percent of what they would get for that particular charter. So I'm putting two and two together. I'm noticing a huge absence of these buses of of a dolphin and all these other companies. I'm thinking, you know what? I bet you these people 
like any like anything else, the price wars. So they gather these, and anyone who is going to do seeking out a charter, you know, let's say you got a group of people, you want to take them, let's say, from wherever you're at to the next town, you're going to host some, whatever it is. You got a little league team, a basketball team, whatever the case might be, you need to charter a bus. You could do a gig. You need to charter a bus. Every company that's going to do this is not just going to come, not going to call one company and then take that first, you know, offer. Because you want to see, well, geez, can I save more money? Let me call over here. And I bet you all these other companies, like any, anything else, everyone is in, the, in business to make money. So they're going to be competitive. And so they, they do the phone calls and they figure, geez, and TNT is gonna save me, let's say about three hundred bucks. I'm gonna save three hundred bucks, or this other company's gonna send, save me five hundred and sixty bucks. No matter what it is, I may have some savings, some pretty serious savings that could be noticeable on the books. So I need to go this route. So I asked them. I asked, and this they, they got mad when I asked them this, but I had to. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, well, if you're going to pay me 18% of what you're going to make, and let's say you know everything's going on like this, and you have to lower your price because you got to be competitive. Sorry, guys. I put that on a charger. So that means to stay in the game, now you need to lower your price so that you don't lose all your clients because all your clients are going with these other companies. They're not picking you. You're too high. So now you get the idea we got to lower our prices, guys. Okay? So then what happens is my pay is going to go down. When I brought that up, they said, no, oh, but no, 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 you don't understand. You're still getting 18%. Okay. So let's say I'm going to pick up a group of people from Miami and I'm going to take them up to Tampa. And whatever is your 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 charge, and let's say my pay for that particular gig. Sorry, guys, I got to do this. So let's say my particular pay for that for that assignment, I'm gonna make fifteen hundred bucks. Most most likely it'll be like seven. Or let's say eight. Make to do them numbers. Make it easy. Eight hundred dollars, right? But because you had the lawyer, because now you said eighteen percent of whatever it would, would come out to me ma ma making. $800. But now, because you had to lower your price, you're still telling me I'm making 18%. Yeah, but I'm making 18% of a lower price. So now I might only make 600 I might only make 400 But I still got to go through the same distance. They didn't like that answer. They didn't like that question. After I asked them that question, then all of a sudden they're telling me, well, you know, it wasn't really a smooth drive when I rode with you. It wasn't... Well, then why didn't you tell me that before? I mean, don't you think that if there's a complaint, you should, as soon as we get back to the base and pull me aside, hey, listen, Dave, you know, when we're on Express, I could feel it going like this a little bit. Let, let's take you on the road again. You know, I want to make sure that you're able to, because our clients are high end, you know. They don't want to drop the, the little cherry on the cigarette on their polyester pants, you know. No. They decide to wait like two or three days after the fact and after I asked this question. And right then and there, I knew I hit a nerve. I'm not saying I'm, I, 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 I am a good driver, okay? But I know there's people that are just as good and, and better than me. That's reality. I got no problem with that. But if there's an issue, you should address the issue like right then and there. So I knew it was a bunch of BS. It had to do with the question about the money, not about the driving. So it's like, okay, 40 miles one way, and then I asked about paid uh, a training, and they had no question. They couldn't answer the question, but I did, get the, I did get the paid training. But 40 miles one way, 40 miles another, that's 80 miles. So I'm putting 80 miles five days a week, because I'd be going back and forth, on the vehicle. So I'm starting to lose out on what's going on with the car because, you know, wearing and tearing the car, you gotta, you gotta make sure that you keep your vehicle up because that is also gonna get you back and forth. You know, guys, when I say the things I say about the music, I'm not trying to be negative, but Deb and I know from 
doing 100% out of our pocket. All those road shows that we've done, we'd be crossing like four and five states, man. Go from Illinois down to Texas, to Arizona, all out of our pocket. And we got paid good for it. I'm not saying we didn't. I know that if I were to sit down with the actual numbers with some of my friends that toured, they might say, listen, you need to make more money because we were making that much more money because they take that extra more out of your pocket, you know, because they got to pay for the bus. Those drivers don't drive for free. Fuel cost, right? But what they don't understand is they were in a more different position than we were and it wasn't them, it was their management company doing all the negotiating. So my manager, which is my wife, Deb, she's an excellent negotiator. And because she knew how that we were able to still get the gig, still get the job, save them money, and still make money. We were able to do that. We weren't super greedy, in other words. And that's what will kill a person when they start doing this for a living. You gotta be smart, and doesn't mean you're gonna always make this as a full time gig. It's gonna always go like this. So, and they, now a good example is when you're in your personal vehicle, even if you're gonna rent, you could rent, lease, or lease a car, but rent, you know, you still gotta be careful. You start things bumping up inside the side of the car, unless you get a cargo van, but even if you put scratches on it, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to pay for it. And then you gotta make sure it's back full tank. Make sure there's no wear and tear on tire. They're going to get you one way or another. Because they need to make money too. So when you do this 100% on your own with your vehicle, now you understand that, hey, I got to make sure that I'm able to make the money, but I'm not going to price myself out of a job. And I have to make sure that, you know, I watch my mileage. Always make sure I get the oil change, you know, and make write everything down because you're going to have wear and tear on your vehicle. That's why I always said, if you can find other streams of income, do it. Because when you put this as your main source of income, and like some of these people did down here in the, the restaurants and all that place blew, blew away from the hurricane, they're hitting the panic button. And that's real sad because they didn't think this one out. No one, no one thought this hurricane was going to come this side of, of uh, Florida. I know when we first moved down here, we were told, don't worry about it, the hurricanes... If they come to the golf site, they're, they're going to be real, real light. It's just like a windstorm. That's all. Not, and they're not, it's not even a bad windstorm. Hurricane Irma, when we first got down, looked worse than what it really was. Because by the time it got by us, it went down to like maybe a Category 2. And didn't even really hit our area too, too bad at all. But this last one, Hurricane Ian, it was Upper Hurricane 5. And some people say, yeah, I mean, Upper Hurricane 4. They're arguing, or some people are saying that it's really a hurricane category 5, but for the sake of insurance companies, they don't call it a 5. But it it did a lot of damage. And, you know, it's going to take years for some of these places to be rebuilt. So what happened? Now what happens with your gigs? You see? And that, that's not just the restaurants. It took out a lot of other companies, too. So, you know, keep that in mind. But... Now what they got to do is hurry up and hustle. We're going to try to get the restaurants for the tours to come back. But we also have to save our needs job. The restaurants and the, and the hotels, they're needs too. Because, you know, that's the thing with you living in a, a state that's heavily, heavily t reliant on tours. You know, and for the main support. So now they're starting to go more a manufacturer down here. Because they're building a lot of... Um, they're building a lot of factories and doing some manufacturing down here, which is a great thing to do. They really need to because we're having a, a such a huge influx of people moving down here. It's it's unreal. The amount of building I'm seeing going on is just unreal. But everything is going to have that domino effect, and it's going to affect everything. So you got to kind of really, really, um, you know, be smart and be wise about it. You know, I would see these videos pop up about how to deal with rejection and how to you know, stay in the game and that, and there, there, there's a lot of great advice. But I think what has happened is why there are so many of these videos I've seen, whether if you're doing voiceover or whatever it is, videography, uh, 
uh, music license, whatever the case might be, whatever you're getting into, you're going to see these videos pop up on these pep talks, helping you get through uh, dealing with the rejection, and of course with the music and the gigs, all that. But part of what happens is everyone wants to hurry up and leave a solid source of income for the dream, and I get it. And you know what? You're not going to know until you take that chance. But if your gut feeling is saying to you, maybe I need to save a little bit more money. Maybe I need to stay an extra year at the day job so I know for sure I can keep the business afloat. So if something happens, it's not going to crash and burn right away. It might crash. It might burn. But I'm not gonna, it's not going to do me in real quick. I'm going to have some sort of a financial cushion so I can make a quick recovery. And I can go back to work. Don't, don't, you know, burn the bridges and making sure I've got the solid source of income so that I can get myself back up financially and then I can still, it doesn't mean you got to quit, you know, your passion or your dream. Just find out that, okay, this could take me a little bit more. I might have to do this part-time and, you know, work the day job and do this part-time, but I could still make an impact and, and still create my dream and make that impact. But now... I don't have to rely on, on the sole source of income because the first time I tried that, everything went down the toilet. It happens. It doesn't mean that that it all. It doesn't mean that you're not good. It just means at that moment you didn't find, think it out financially. All the other hidden possibilities that could happen. And I'll be honest with you guys, this the hurricane also you know took out some music stores. Some I know one in particular definitely closed. Um, but when you think of hurricanes, you're always thinking about your house, but you don't think so much about the other businesses. You know what I mean? Because your main concern is, is your house, your home until when it happens. And then you drive around, you see all the destruction. It's not just the homes. It's also businesses. So whether you're a gigging musician, whether you are a cook, a chef, you know, a bus boy, a waitress, or let's say you work in an insurance company or, you know, the building gets wiped out, man. It's just total devastation, demolished, smashed down to rubble. Well, guess what? Now you're not going to, you're not going to have that income from that building. Um, so it makes you really think. And then you add to the fact that now with the permits, after the permits are being dragged out. So now it's taken longer for the rebuild of some of these places. So the longer that something is down, the longer you are going without that income. And I think some of the people are realizing it pretty much. And that's why Deb and I, we looked at each other and we said, you know what? We're so glad that we went back to work while we're still physically able to and we're able to do our music. And it's like we haven't really lost anything. Yeah, we've lost about 75% of our gigs, even though I'm still gigging. But my Saturday gig, that place, you know, they said it was going to hopefully open in December. Maybe no later than January. And here it is February. And it's part of the reason is getting the permits. So, yeah, I lost that gig until they rebuilt. But they lost their source of income. So I don't fault them at all. So... Here's another thing to keep in mind. If you're a musician and you're in an area where there's, you know, natural disasters, it's going to be tough. And, you know, you know how it is with the gigs. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. It'll be tough. But the worst thing you do is let your emotions just take over and you become so negative that you start trashing and bashing these people because they're not paying you for the gig what they could. Or they're, 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 you know, can't reopen. They're not going to have music for a while. Even though they have reopened. Because, see, they have a criteria that they have to go through, too. And we're all in it together. The ones who are the bad actors, you need to stay away from them. They're not worth your time. But the ones who have been good to you and are going through the same thing you're going through, try to understand and it was one time one of the ladies that owns a restaurant, she just, I guess she said to one band, basically, why don't they just get a job? If they're that hurting, go out and get a job. 
I mean, some of these people, you'd be surprised how many business owners have that side job, you know, for that solid income coming in, especially if they're new. Because they got to have that money coming in because what comes in from the business has to go right back into the business. You guys understand, but there's a lot of people that don't. So this is what I mean. So anyways, Zach Dong, what's happening, man? It is a great, this guitar has been so reliable, man. It's been a great, great guitar. Um, what, 12 years, 13 years now we've had it? Yeah, not enough buses to rent now. They're, yeah, they are. They are. And you know what? You know what, Bumble Best? I did not realize this, and I should have, but um, Gus G from Firewind, and then he was, he, he, he was on one of uh, Ozzy Osbourne's albums. He did a tour with I. We've seen him at Ozfest. But um, he had said, it was oh, wait a minute, it wasn't him. Actually, it was Herman Lee from Dragon Force. He had a live stream or a video he put up, whatever it was. And he was talking about the buses. And this is after the COVID thing and all that. Um, they couldn't get the tour buses with the hitch to pull the trailer because now they were being rented out probably from all the sports sporting games. So he he what he he mentioned about I think the band was called Moonspell. And he said they were gonna go on tour and they had to cancel some either they had to cancel some of the tours, some of the dates, or they had to cancel all the dates. And he had made the comment, you know, this is very expensive. And I guess Herman Lee was also doing the financing for Dragon Force. If he wasn't doing all of it, he had a big part of it, so he knows what's coming in and what's going out. And as soon as he mentioned about, well, he mentioned the T-shirts. I've been printing up the T-shirt. Now the, the tour gets canceled. And that's when he went on to saying, one of the problems we're having is that we cannot get tour buses, rent the tour buses that have the hitch. So we could pull the trailer with our gear. Big problem there. And then I thought, geez, you know what? This guy's right because you got to rent all this stuff out. You, the company, the record, somebody has to rent this out. It doesn't magically appear. And then sometimes these companies will have union drivers. You got to pay union wages. Everything's money, 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 money. So he basically said it's very expensive to go out and tour. To do major tours because you got to also rent out those buildings and you better have insurance i know we have insurance for our company our music company i think that says it'll it'll cover um like three million dollars and you probably say geez how do you why do you have to have that well when you do the casinos you better have insurance and lately a lot of higher end hotels or convention halls they they really want you to have the insurance or if you could do what we were doing, like called stage shows, you're doing a show and selling tickets, you're rent or you're renting. However, you're renting that that facility out, that building or that room out. They want to make sure you got insurance, because if someone gets hurt, who's gonna pay for this? You know, it was your event. We, if you were not here having that music event, this room probably would have been closed. Therefore, no one would got hurt. Therefore, we wouldn't be getting a lawsuit. So everything is about protection. So. You know, you could, you can, anyone could really apply to get these, these, you know, types of insurance. Yeah, you're going to pay. But there are insurance companies that deal with musicians. And, of course, Deb, she's got all those details. But I was, um, it was, it was interesting. But the point is that, you know, to do any of this, you've got to make sure you've got all your bases covered. It's not like playing at a, a, a bar gig. It, it's a different world. It really is. And uh, sometimes you feel like it's more of a headache, you know. But the advantage of doing that is you could put, it's your, your production, it's your show, because it's your money. So it's your show, your way, as long as you respect the facility that you're renting out. You know, don't be an idiot and smash things, you know, you can't do that. But other than that, you buy by what those what the protocols, what the rules are for renting that space, and you do your thing. Any, put it this way, anyone that has to had to host 
their daughter's wedding. You know, usually it's the, the, the brides, parents of the bride. They're going to pay for the wedding, right? Dad, dad is going to pay for his, his uh, little girl to get married. Well, talk with those people. Because they're going to give you kind of a, a, a little bit of an insight of what it's like. You're renting out space is what you're doing. So, and here, a little, little, little bit of advice for this. If you do get involved in doing weddings, and let's say you have any type of to say so, if you're a DJ, you play the music in live band, whatever, and they're dancing, we, we never really had this issue until the first time we actually did this with a friend of ours. And, and it, this was, well, what was this? 2000, when we did the DJ. Debbie used to do DJ too, you know. You try to be creative with music, try to incorporate certain things. What well, was our friend, Billy, getting married? And I, I can't remember what year it was now. It was maybe 2010 or something like that. I don't know. But the place that we were playing at, we had our gear, we had our insurance, everything was fine. But the bartender came up and said, hey, make sure you watch these people. When they get on that dance floor, remind them, do not bring their glasses of beer, champagne, or bottles of beer on the dance floor. Because they're out there like this. They drop it. It breaks. Sometimes ladies like to take off the high heels, right? And they cut their feet. And if they cut like a main art, even if they just cut, it, you know, a small cut. You're bleeding. Boom, I'm going to sue. So, obviously, this has been happening. So, for him to say this, because I remember way back in the day when we would do, like, the New Year's Eve gigs and that, we never, well, see, there was a drummer doing the booking for that, so he was handling, maybe he was, had those conversations, I don't know. But I just don't remember it being that bad back in the 80s. You know? Now, it's like, look out, here they come. So, it's just something to think about, guys. Uh, yeah, that's true, Bumble Best. Will you retire uh, gigging, Dave? I don't think so, Bumble Best. We have been getting more and more involved, like some studio sessions here and there and all that because of, you know, lost a lot of places to play at. Um, and I'm, I'm very blessed and very fortunate because I'm what I'm doing is, I'm not the only one. But I fall among the minority doing this type of music. Instrumental guitar music, whether it's metal, shred guitar, jazz fusion. Uh, your average bar gigs, restaurant, bar and, gear, bar and grill gigs, they're all singing, they're all playing covers. So sometimes it could be a hard sell. And you learn ways of selling yourself to get the gig. Um, but again, I've been very blessed and fortunate because the one thing is, it seems, now I'm not saying everyone is like this, but it seems the majority of these people that are doing these covers, they're more, um, focused on what popular song they could play. And of course, in the rehearsal, you want to, you want to tighten the song. I'm not saying they're hacks or anything like that, but it becomes more primary to think about playing the popular song as opposed to playing something similar, but being really good at your craft. Because they'll, some of these people are saying, I don't understand, I'm playing, I'm playing the song like on the radio, it's the most popular song, no one's getting into it. Well, you might, you might think that some of these people are sick of that song. And you might think that some people are actually there for the music. So they want an experience rather than their favorite song. Not everybody, because there's people who don't like what I'm doing, that's fine, I don't take that personal. And then, of course, you as a performer, you got to like what you're doing in order to bring life to the music. you got to make sure it's alive. Now, when you add to the fact that it's all instrumental and there are no vocals, you it's like you got to do double duty. You know? So these people got to understand that. And I've had some people that it's not their cup of tea. That's fine. I've had some people come up and tell me it's not their cup of tea, but they enjoyed watching me because they said, man, I could tell you had the passion for it. Yeah, I, I, I was here last week. And yeah, the guy is singing and he's playing a pop, but it's like he doesn't look like he likes what he's doing. It's like, 
I, I, I didn't feel it. And he was playing like one of my favorite songs. And he's singing, but I just didn't feel it. You're playing something I never heard of, and I really not my thing, but man, you, I could tell your passion is so strong. And I would say basically, you know, I try to, I try to project the things that influenced me and how I saw music when I was growing up. It was something very special. Like it, it took you to a different world, you know. Forget about all your problems, you're being transported. Just for that moment in time. You know, and of course, when you don't sing, you don't make the guitar come to life, you know. So, and other times I make mistakes too. There are times I'm worn out too. I'm, I'm only human, but you do the best you can, you know. It's not always about the scale and that chord. And if you're using the latest and greatest effect pedal, all that is great. But one of the key ingredients in making music is making music, you know. Pulling it out of your soul, bringing life into those notes. There was, I used to see this ad when Carlos Santana was offering the online lesson, you know, master class. And he'd play a note and he'd be standing like that and give that face, you know. He said, It ain't gonna sound like that if you don't stand like that. It's emotion, first and foremost. And the theory is there, the theory is the analytical side of, of watching music. But the emotion is what conveys the feeling, not 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 the scale, you know. That has something to do with it, yeah. But that's not the emotional part. That's not what's going to pull people in. Unless you're going to do a a master theory class, well then, yeah, go for it, you know. Anyways, my friends, I I, I hope this has helped with explaining the capo. It's, there's people that use this way more, way better than I do, but. Just keep in mind, for sake of simplicity, wherever you put this on, you just change the pitch of, of the notes on, on the fretboard. And when you look at what notes are, you just got to keep that in mind. It changed everything. If it's not explained on the sheet music, then you got to look at it for what you'll find out. Put the tuner on the headstock. And if the capo is on the fifth fret and you're playing on your fifth string, your A string, and you call it A minor, you can find out that's not A minor, you know, the chord. Because that note right there is not A, it's D. It just changed. So, anyways, my friends, I really appreciate you guys tuning in and hanging with me here. Um, yeah, I bet you would make a uh, <laughs> bank and vet. Yeah, well, you know what, Surf Nine? We did. We did a little something over there, unofficial, really. And I talked with some of the performers over there. Now, this was in around 2002, so things could have changed. And there's probably different levels of, because you have to go through an agent. That's one thing you have to do. If you do anything in Vegas, you got to go through an agent. Otherwise, it's going to be real tough. Well... This one guy was telling me, this guy and girl, they were saying, yeah, how they have us do these type of gigs. Where you go from one hotel, you go to another hotel, you know. Be like kind of you're, 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 you're starting out, getting yourself established. So they can have you do the hotel circuit. He said, they'll have us play 15 minutes and give us something like 40 minutes off. Because then he has booked us at, let's say, five different hotels. So we had to go through Luxor, uh, Excalibur, and I, we used to be in Mandalay Bay. I don't know if it's still there. We go across the street, you know, under the tunnel to the Mandalay Bay. And then you got the MGM. It used to be, I don't know, I haven't been there in a while. The last time we were there was 2006, I think. Anyways, so you got all these going on. And so it gives you that much time to grab your gear, go to the next hotel, set up and play. Have you do like a 15, maybe it's 15 to 20 minutes, but it wasn't long. I was kind of surprised. Kind of surprised. Um, but to do some of those major, into getting into the major gigs, and I mean the major without being super major, like, you know, Celine Dion or something like that. I'm talking about where you start getting into the smaller theater types, maybe even as an opening act. you got to have an agent. They won't, they won't do anything, at least at that time. It could be different now. But to answer your question, um, 
I when I have people ask me, would you be nervous to play in front of so many stars? Well, you always get that, especially if it's your, you know, people you admire. But then once you get playing, your mind just zoom goes right into the fretboard, right into this atmosphere, and then you start realizing over the course of time, doing this for many, many years, yeah, there are these iconic people, and they're the people that inspire you, they're the people you look up to, but you have done so many gigs now under your belt, because a few decades have passed, now you start to realize, okay, this is what they went through when they were at this level, and now it's almost like you kind of view it as, I'm at this job, and these are not... They're, they're, they're like my bosses, they're my inspiration, but they're kind of like the co-workers, the people that had done this before me. Now it's my turn to do this. And you don't think about them bashing and trashing you so much as you do. Now it's my turn to make the stage come alive. Now I'm going to put you know, my inspiration into it. I, yeah, I know I'm not going to please everybody. Maybe not. You hope you do. But you don't think about that negative feeling so much. You start thinking about bringing the whole show to life because you know there's going to be people that say, wow, what an experience I had. This was great because at the end of the day, the reality is if you impress those people so much that they want to come back and see more, they chances are they're going to spend that money to come back and see you. I've had where people had said to me, I got you, you get chance. They said, yeah, I was here about a year and a half ago. And you were playing here. That's when I first saw you. And, you know, it takes us time to save our money. We come back down. Or, or we come down. We go to different places. But now we're down in the Cape Coral area and uh, on this vacation. And I told my wife, hey, since we're down here, I, I want to go back and see if that guitar player is playing at Yucatan's again. I, I, Man, I can't find anything like this. Now, this is where you could position yourself when you have something that's slightly different than what the norm is out there. Some people who say, yeah, you might not get as much work, like, you know, working eight days a week and 26 hours a day, you know, figuratively speaking. But what you could position yourself is, yeah, but now you're so unique, you're not doing what everyone else is doing. Now, they want to come down to see you. That right there is, it's a very humbling, you know, a very humbling experience. When you got some of these people that, and a lot of them, man, they were CEOs of major companies. They're retired. They want to, you know, they tip good. They want to see you play. When we done, um, you know, quite a few of these um, these corporate gigs, um, one instantly comes to mind that kind of blew my mind was when we did uh, the thing for the the gig for the uh, Kentucky Derby, and. Um, They had us up on the rooftop, and they said there was going to be celebrities there. And, you know, we were very great, grateful that we were there playing, you know. She likes the style of music I play, so she was in t this one girl was in, t in charge of having the entertainment. And she did say each year they do a different thing, so each year it is different. And this particular year, they picked up, so I think this was... Mm, 2010 yeah it was just the year before my sister passed so we do the gig and you know we're up on the rooftop and then the door opens and all these girls come out kind of I don't want to say dressed scandalously but almost you could tell there was something different and I'm gonna be honest instantly I thought okay is this gonna be something like inappropriate because I didn't sign up for this, you know. We didn't know, because we really didn't know. We don't, we don't really follow the Kentucky Derby that much, and we just thought this was a separate company. We did not know this was like one of the major companies, and I mean major companies that had hired us. And then here comes all these girls, and then here comes Kate Upton, and of course Deb. She took a picture with me, you know, standing next to Kate Upton, Upton my arm around her, and she's got her arm around me, and you know. Here's my sweetie. He wants to be a part of the show. Oh, he, he wants to be a part of the show. Yeah, he can come in. Yeah, kitty boy. Oh, okay, I gotta move this. I gotta move this. Yeah. So, anyways, my little capo. So, 
All right, what an experience it is. Darren Levine, who was the sports announcer, announcer, a guest on CNBC Squawk Box. So he's there talking with us. And again, it's not registering in my mind. We got invited to the VIP party. And we're on the roof, and I guess the VIP party was on the fifth floor. So we get invited. And then, I, and I'm not being honest, I don't follow sports. But there's everybody from ESPN. Every major announcer, every major sports player that was at that event at that, that time, man, they were there. They were there. And I'm looking at this. I'm looking at them. I said, there's a guy that had the TV show on, uh, on the History Channel. And here's this guy. Here's that guy. And all, I mean, coming up to me, you know, shaking my hand. Some of these people, they play guitar. And the, the weirdest thing that, that happened was when they're asking me, because I was doing a lot of the flamenco stuff, and, you know, keeping it like rock, but the flamenco, you know. So they're, they were watching me play, and I didn't realize they were up on the roof watching me. I'm just in my own world, I guess, zoning out, you know. But then they're coming up to me asking me, where did you learn that technique? Man, I've been, you know, I play, but, man, I can't play like that. I mean, so in their mind... I'm not someone just from Aurora, Illinois. Never mind, I'm like just a star that's, you know, from Spain or something, you know. It was the weirdest thing. And I was very, you know, uh, obviously I was a very uh, uh, polite with them. I said, well, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. To me, it's a gift from God, but it's just something I've been doing for a long time. And it's like anything else, you know, you learn a technique, you nurture it, you help it grow. But it becomes a way of life. When you get up in the morning, you practice, you find some way. I said, kind of like what you guys do, and like with the Olympics. You know, when the Olympics is over, yeah, they're going to take some rest because they need that. But it won't take long for them to be back in the training game. Instantly, they knew exactly what I was talking about because I'm talking with some of these superstars of sports. But yet, they're talking to me like I'm the superstar of music. Even, and I'm going to tell you, what, a lot of these people... Yeah, they, they'll, they'll follow, you know, you know, like, they know who Taylor Swift is and, and Lady Gaga and all that. But they also, especially the ones who play music, they also know about people like Ingve Malmsteen, Al Demiola, Joe Satriani, you know, Earl Klug, George Benson, uh, Anno Vitovic. I mean, they know the major, major musicians who are the guitar players. And to hear them talk and drop these names, like, oh, you, you're talking my language, you know? But it's so weird. At that moment in time, you're no longer way down here and they're way up here. You're kind of like this. Because as much, and I think part of it is because they might have realized I don't recognize them or I'm not star, star, stars in my eyes. Oh, hanging on them. But I'm showing them the respect. And that's the advantage of when you don't follow a certain, like for me, I don't follow sports that much. It's just the way it is. But I respect them. And they see that, and they're like, finally, I got someone that's not going to be, you know, could you give me a gig? Could you give me, you know, my, my son, he plays basketball. Could you? It's a gimme, gimme, gimme. They don't want that. They just want to be able to talk to you like a regular person because at the end of the day, they're tired too. You know, we're all human. And when you show them the respect, they'll show you the respect. It was very bizarre, a very bizarre experience. It made me realize, you know, we're all different, and there's different levels of players. There's different levels of class in society. But you know what? We'll all put our drawers on one leg at a time. And when you have that equal amount of respect, I'm talking about the good people. You're going to run into the people that are the a-holes, no matter if they're up here in... Um, social status or down here in social status it doesn't matter but if you have the the a likable personality and you show the respect you know try not to you know we're all going to have our our issues where we take things a little bit personal we just learn how to deal with it if you don't take it too personal you know don't let it show you do the best you can they're going to see that those good people are going to see that and they're going to have that respect for you and that's really what counts because that's how your name gets circulated. Hey, man, I doubt that this guy called me. There were Trans Acoustic Productions was our old company name. Now it's Dave Byron LLC. But the people that 
if they wanted to find it, if they wanted to look us up, those, those agents there, they'll find us because they'll say, oh yeah, they changed the name now, they're, just, they're down in Florida, okay. Because we'll still get some of these gigs that pop up. Whether we take them, whether we don't, usually we take them, you know. But this is my advice if you could do, if you start to make this, take this serious and start to take this into a business, you really do got to treat it like a business. It means, you know, you got to put your issues away of your, your rejected, when you get the rejected feeling, don't go on bashing people because and it's going to circulate, it's going to circulate, you're going to ruin your name if you start to trash and bashing. You bring things up when you have to, but you do it very discreetly in order to protect other people so they don't get burned, you know what I mean? That's the only time you, but to get on the trash and bashing, especially if it's like a bar, there's so many of these places, you know, show them respect, walk away. Because they're going to remember that. And they're going to say, you know what? We didn't have this problem we dealt with Dave, uh, Deb and Dave. We never had that problem. You know? All these other people, everyone's superstars, you know, and all this other stuff. But they're issues. They're, we're having issues. They're hard to work with. We don't get the problem with these guys. With Dave, uh, you know, Deb and Dave. We don't get that. So it's something to think about. I know I said I was gonna. Uh, JS Lava, how are you doing, dear? Yeah, I am late. I am uh, interested in this subject, and will, uh, yeah, definitely be listening now, and we'll catch up with what I missed. Absolutely, that's why I leave these up. You know, I don't, I don't get mad and turn down. Oh, there's not nobody watching. No, there might not be when I was in the beginning. There might not be having people watching, but maybe they got other things they gotta do. But this is valuable information that can help them when they watch the replay. What's wrong with that? Yeah. Yeah, being famous has to be terrible. Like, really. Yeah, yeah, Bumble Bess. Yeah. You could, you could see where... The impression I get from the people we've met at, at these type of gigs. We've done a gig uh, for Lucas Oils. We're in the, in the guy's... Uh, guest clubhouse on this huge property i mean huge they found he was the owner of the indiana colts there's the big super bowl ring stone there guy comes up asking me if i'm being treated i go absolutely and they got fancy fingers there i said thank you sir I, i'm really enjoying this and this is such a, a a great event to uh participate in and and to be able to be with and a part of it's just, it's, it's very humbling well, you have a good day, young man. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely will. And I'll definitely be uh, thanking everybody for having us. He gave me a thumbs up. Walks away. Another guy comes up to me. He goes, he's a nice guy, right? Start talking a little bit. Yeah, you know who he is? No. That's the owner of the Indiana Colts. I'm like, I'm meeting these people. And it's so weird because as a musician, you want to be on these, these big tours, you know, open up for Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and all that. But then sometimes fate has you in this other sector but you're meeting just as, as as important people as that sector like when we did the gig for uh ussg i think it's, it's it was on the nato base we were over at nato doing that gig and you know you're i'm playing and i'm looking i'm seeing these people at home and these people are important you know and again, you, you get in your zone and you just, you focus at the job at hand. So they, they see that, you know, they see that and they recognize that. Um, that's how you carry yourself. That's what's going to help you get those important gigs. And never take it personal if you don't get the gig. You might not get that gig at that time, but maybe, maybe later on. If, if there's one thing people could remember to do is protect your reputation and be as polite as possible. And when someone's trashing and bashing, remove yourself and say, I'm going over there. You could stay over there and you could debate with yourself all day long. I'm going over there. I don't have time to waste. Um, and of course, over a course of time, when you get the people doing this behind your back about you, the smart people are going to see this and they're going to say, well, gee, man, what are you saying about me then? You know, if you're saying it about him, what are you saying about me, you know? And they're not going to want to deal with it. You know, they, they move on because they know everything goes forward. You, that's what you want to do. You want to move forward in life. 
Um, when when you start looking at this, it's 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 a gift. It's artistic. It's it's you know creativity. But there is that 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 other section, that other side, is that when you now turn your creativity and your passion into a business, now there's that side that you got to also deal with. And I'm so blessed and fortunate being married to Deb because, you know, I have learned so much from her. It's it's incredible. When I look back, I'm like, whoa. If I if I would have thought now like I did way back then, I would have never gotten these gigs. Because I would let my emotions run wild. Oh, they don't like me or this or that, you know. With all that aside, think as a professional. When people say they're professional, they got to really prove that they're professional to do this, to do this, those type of gigs, and to really get your name, you know, noticed. One way you can find out um, is with the social media thing. My advice is, do not put yourself in a position unless it's something that's absolutely necessary. You got to say something. But don't give these people that want to give you negativity, they want to give you low numbers, whether it's views or subscription, do not feed into that. Don't. Because over a long course of time, it could be even a short course of time, your actions are going to speak so much bigger than those words. And when the people start looking, hey, I need to hire somebody. Let me see some video. Let me see what's going on here. And I, you know, I, I, I want to have something really nice and, you know, I'm going to pay this person a little bit. And they see how you carry yourself. See how you play. Oh, I like what you're playing. They see how you carry yourself. Then that's when the ball starts moving forward in your court. Because they see how, they'll, they'll see, you know, how you hand things. You know, especially if they start watching you and they start seeing this, there's a pattern here. You're not feeding into it. You're moving forward. You try to be as respectful and polite as possible. And then once the ball starts moving forward and you continue on like that, you start building up a history, a track record of being reliable, being polite, someone you know they can count on. You're not hard to work with. You know you know how to negotiate. You understand what's happening, what's out there. Because you, you start building up a history of actually doing these things not just talking about but you actually done these things and then they'll say okay I'm gonna hire this guy I, this, is, this is what I want and then your name will be the name that's always mentioned you can rely on them they're good oh you don't like the sound is okay well maybe next time if you're gonna have that I highly re recommend them because they're professional they show up on time there's no issues they you know they're insured especially if it's not something high end you know they got all the, you know, T's crossed and I's dotted. And I'm telling you, it, it does matter. And the social media thing, it matters, man. It matters because people see it. People see it. So that that would be my advice. Moving forward with, with anything. Yeah. I got to go. I'll watch you guys. Yeah, absolutely, Janice. Don't worry, guys. I really appreciate it. I didn't mean to be on this long. Um, but I hope everything with the capo in the beginning of this can help, you know, and again, this is what I tell everyone now, now we're starting to do our, our lessons, our video lessons up online. We're, we'll be posting all that on our website and that. Um, but the best thing to do is it's you learn it. You know, you have to learn what's going to work with you and, and, you know, you can make that connection with someone that helps out. That's fine. You know, cause it is about you learning not someone that's going to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. I mean, they're, they're there to help. But, again, it's your your fingers are attached to your hands, not mine or anyone else's. And your interest level is you. You're going to do what you want with your money. So, always remember that. Uh, but we'll keep everyone posted with those lessons. But this is why I have, I have not posted up a whole lot of information out there because... Now we're going, also, we have this happening for us, and it's not fair for people who are paying money to me to turn around and give away free information. It's not fair for them, and it wouldn't be fair for you either, you know, so. But anyways, we appreciate all your support. We will be streaming live tomorrow from 6 to 9 back at Jungle Bird. 
and um, you know, I'm trying to move some music around and that, but you know, we got trying to learn as much as possible new and all that. But anyways, we'll be doing live tomorrow, so I hope you guys can join us. If not, we always leave it up on the replay. So I hope you guys have a great, great rest of your Sunday evening. Thank you so much for watching and all your support. We will see you tomorrow if you can. If not, watch the replay. Until then, you stay strong, safe, and true. Rock on and God bless you, my friends. Take care and God bless you. We love you all. Thanks for watching.